Well, welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Tobias Nathy. I'm the director of the St. James Project and a colleague and friend of Monsignor Frank Lane who will be speaking with us tonight. So, first I just want to say happy feast day. John Paul II. It was pretty awesome. I, I imagine most of us, if not all of us, um, were, were around during JP2's pontificate and we even had a chance to see him. So it's great to be able to be here on this occasion, his first feast day, and reflect on his life and his efforts in ecumenism, his efforts to promote Christian unity. So, to that end, we have Monsignor Frank Lane, who will be speaking on John Paul II's legacy of ecumenism. His talk is specifically, Charity and Truth, Challenge to Christian Unity. In short, how did John Paul II reach out to fellow Christians who aren't Catholic, and what can we learn from his example? Monsignor Lane has a doctorate from the Ohio, Ohio State University in European history and has taught on the faculties of, among others, the Pontifical College Josephinum, the seminary in Columbus, St. Bonaventure University, and of course, Mount St. Mary's Seminary of the West, Athenaeum of Ohio, where he currently serves as spiritual director and also teaches a course on Franciscan Christology right now, which we're also, St. James Project is also broadcasting for those who have paid for the course. So it's pretty, pretty neat. He's our, he's our first effort there in doing uh, online courses there. Um, Monsignor Lane is very well known, very well regarded for his, um, his retreats, his talks, his homilies. Um, he's in fact giving uh, the nuptial mass homily for myself and Rachel, which is, which is wonderful. So really happy to have him speaking here. And he's currently writing a book on St. Bonaventure, so he has his own academic pursuits, which he continues to this day. So we're going to have a little Q&A afterwards, but um, please welcome Monsignor Frank Lane. Thank you, Tobias. Well, it's a privilege to be here on the feast of John Paul II, St. John Paul II, and to take a look at the... Uh, he did, he was in the papacy for so long, he did so much, that when Stephanie called me and asked me to do something um, about ecumenism, at first I thought, well, we're going to have to... We got the theme, but if I did all that, it would just simply be kind of a recitation of events, and that, that isn't really all that interesting. There is a book I, I would like to recommend to you, if you are interested in John Paul II and his ecumenism, and that is a book called The Legacy of John Paul II, edited by Gerald O'Collins and Michael Hayes. And there's a series of essays in here that trace all the different ecumenical overtures that John Paul II engaged in during his, during his papacy. As I looked through that, and I, and I looked through the main encyclical on ecumenism is Ut Unum Sint, begin to realize that even the ecumenical outreach of John Paul II was so extensive that there was no way even to survey that. And I had to kind of then try and focus somewhere. So what I decided to do was go from theme to topic to focus, from the theme of ecumenism to the topic challenges, uh, a challenge uh, to ecumenism, truth and charity. And I decided probably it would be best to end up in one of the most significant endeavors that he was engaged in. And that was an engagement with the Lutheran Church. He made several trips into Germany. He, made, he had several ecumenical services with Lutheran bishops, and he was engaged in some very particular talks and discussions about Lutheranism. And before I do that, you know, we have to ask ourselves kind of, what is ecumenism? And right around the period of Vatican II, which some of us recall and remember, there was this idea of ecumenism that kind of was the I don't know, do you remember Rodney King? It was kind of the Why Can't We All Get Along School of Ecumenism? Where, you know, it doesn't matter as long as you're all nice to each other, and after all, we're all good people, so what difference does it make? So we went through this what difference does it make motif for a while. 
until we begin to run into issues. Because this is something, and why I chose the Lutheran debate, was because this is something that is something we can really kind of grasp and understand. Ultimately, ultimately, what we believe makes a difference in who we are and how we live. What kind of societies we build, what kind of laws we value, what kind of social structures are important to us. And I think that that is something that the idea of general religion loses altogether. I think there's another kind of tool we can use to look at it. And that tool is kind of interpersonal relationships. You know, if a young man and a young woman decide to date, and one of them says, I'm going to watch real carefully, I'm going to see exactly what the other person wants me to be, and then that's who I'm going to become. It's generally not a good way to sustain a relationship. Because eventually, that starts to fall apart. Because who we are as persons begins to come through, no matter how hard we try to rebuild our inner selves into another model, another image. That's exactly the same thing that happened in the whole ecumenical story. That this idea of a general religion, this idea of, oh well, you know, we're all the same, we're all good people, what difference does it make, went on kind of for a while until we began to run into the fact that what we believed had made us different in some ways from what other people thought and other people were. And so we began to understand that there were some difficulties and there were some rough spots. The turn when that happened within the church, the turn was interesting and it's still in this stage. And that turn was, well, we have to go back and resolve the theological issues. Fair enough. Theological issues dealt with as concepts. For instance, in the Lutheran Catholic debate, the big thing is about justification by faith. Now what that means to each of us might be very vague in our lives. But it's a huge issue. And I, what I'd like to do is look at what the pieces of that issue really are. And so when we say then that we're going to find some kind of Christian unity within a conceptual framework, we're really not going to be altogether successful. Because through the centuries of differences of theological understanding, we have developed differences in how we live our lives, what values we have, how we understand ourselves, and how we understand the world in which we live. There was a seminal work in this over a hundred years ago, and it's still, it's still something worth looking at. It's a book called the Protestant, the, the, the Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism by Max Weber, Max Weber. And he was a German sociologist. He wrote the book in 1905. And if you were to pick it up and read the first 50 pages of it, you would be simply amazed. Because he points out very clearly how economic systems flowed out of theological positions. And so to say, well now, after 500 years or 600 years, we're going to say, we're going to come to a joint declaration on, on justification. And, um, and maybe we will and we already, to a great degree, have. But that doesn't go back and trace the impact of the differences that we have had for half a millennium that has helped to form, to structure societies. Weber's book on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism traces the impact of Calvinism on the economic systems of the West. It's fascinating, phenomenal. And he nails everything. He even, as an agnostic, is very knows very well who we are. And he is able to contrast 
the Catholic ethos from the Calvinist ethos. So when we talk then about ecumenism, we're talking not just about theological, we're not just talking about getting along, we're talking about the deconstruction of the sense of history and looking at what has happened because of this and in so doing, asking ourselves what values do we still want to sustain. In the timeline of John Paul II's engagement with the Lutherans, he began in 1980, two years after he was crowned. And he spoke there then with the Lutheran Bishop of Mainz in Germany, Edward Lohse. And in there, he became familiar with the dialogue that had already been initiated and was already going on under the leadership of Pope Paul VI. In 1983, he paid a formal visit to the Lutheran Church in Rome, and there he preached from the pulpit. In 1987, he went to the city of Augsburg in Germany. In 1530, the final Lutheran Confession of Faith was promulgated in Augsburg, Germany, called the Augsburg Confession. It was constructed primarily by the Lutheran theologian from Wittenberg, Philip Melanchthon, and it was as far as the Lutherans were willing to go at that time for any kind of reconciliation with Catholicism, and it ended up a very long way away. In 1989, John Paul visited the Nordic countries of Norway, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, and participated in many ecumenical services and many ecumenical conversations. Some of it raised eyebrows because he sat with the other bishops of the Lutheran Church and took his turn speaking from the podium as the rest of them did. He didn't set himself apart, which caused problems um, in the Catholic side and perhaps false expectations on the Protestant side. In 1991, there were ecumenical vesp uh, vespers in St. Peter's Basilica commemorating the sixth centenary of the canonization of St. Bridget of Sweden. And there, the Lutheran archbishops of Sweden and of Finland were present for the ecumenical vespers. In 1995, John Paul issued an encyclical on ecumenism called Ut Unum Sint. And there he explored the proper means and the proper way of ecumenism. In 1999, Ecumenical Vespers in St. Peter's again, celebrating the naming of St. Bridget of Sweden as co-patron of Sevilla, and the Pope presided at those Vespers. In the year 2000, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued a declaration, published a declaration called Dominus Jesus. In Dominus Jesus, the Church addressed the issue that had been raised in the De Decree Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council, in which it said that the, that the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. That led to a huge debate about what was the meaning of the word subsist in. In modern catechetics and theology, there was a church ecclesiologist, Francis Sullivan, who took a very broad and open idea of subsist in. And he worked very hard, and it has kind of become the norm, the catechetical norm, at least within Catholicism, which in a way is unfortunate, because Sullivan gives too much elasticity to the phrase, and deliberately ignores the scholastic meaning of the word to subsist in which makes it very clear that the wholeness of the Church of Christ exists within the Catholic Church. And this is what was declared, and this is what was um, explained in Dominus Jesus, which John Paul approved. By the year 2000, he was no longer tremendously capable um, because he was the O'Connor's back you saw him in the year 2000, wasn't it? and he was already somewhat disabled by then from Parkinson's. So he wasn't really um, exerting himself, and he wasn't exerting 
a lot of influence, but he knew what was going on, and he knew what to approve and what not to approve, and he gave his approval to Dominus Jesus, which drew a very, very strong response from the Protestants. Because this basically is what it said. It said the true Church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Catholic Church and is sustained through the Pope, through communion with the Pope and the bishops. There are other, what they call ecclesial communities, which have elements of truth and elements of salvation within them. In that sense, through the authenticity of those elements, they are joined to the Church of Christ. That they, however, have defects in relationship to ordination and to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Well, you can only imagine then kind of the Protestant response to that. The Protestant response to that is, well, then why do we go on talking about anything? And uh, that obviously there's only one thing that they're thinking about. And so he says, it says, particular churches, even though their doctrines differ in their confessions and teaching, have to work towards an ordered life together in communion with other churches based on the common understanding of the gospel. It, uh, the concept of unity um, developed in the paper seems to the author to be obviously incompatible with the Catholic conception of full visible unity. Still recent Catholic developments have shown um, that there is still the ability to have some kind of movement within it. John Paul II was unyielding, and he, in, he, when he says that, um, he says, I am convinced that I have a particular responsibility, above all in acknowledging the ecumenical aspirations of the majority of the Christian communities, and in heeding the request made of me to find a way of exercising the primacy which while in no way renouncing what is essential to its mission, is nonetheless open to new situations. <coughs> he made it very clear that the papacy was not something that was negotiable. The primacy of the Pope as the universal pastor was something that in all ecumenical discussions had to be sustained. He made similar statements concerning the Eucharist. And he also then listed five issues that had to be dealt with in dealing with the Lutherans. The relationship between sacred scripture as the highest authority in matters of faith and sacred tradition as indispensable to the interpretation of God's word. <coughs> the tradition, which is the history of our receiving revelation, is something that the Lutherans would reject. The Eucharist as the sacrament of the body and the blood of Christ, an offering of praise to the Father, the sacrificial memorial and real presence of Christ, and the sanctifying outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Ordination as a sacrament, the magisterium of the church, entrusted the Pope and the bishops in communion with him, understood as a responsibility and authority, exercised in the name of Christ for teaching and safeguarding the faith, the Virgin Mary, as mother of God and icon of the church, the spiritual mother who intercedes for Christ's disciples and for all humanity. This is what John Paul said are the issues that would have to be discussed in any kind of ecumenical endeavors. What I'd like to do is, once we come to the point where we understand that the Holy Father was very adamant that that which is given in Revelation is not negotiable, we have to perhaps find new ways in which we can articulate it and in which we can discuss it. But the fact of those five points are something that must be maintained in any kind of ecumenical dialogue. Part of the reason that John Paul was so successful in his ecumenical endeavors, despite the demand that the givens of Revelation are not negotiable. They are not up for a vote. And they are not up to be discussed away. Find new ways to deal with them is perfectly all right. 
but not to get rid of them. Part of the reason, despite all that, he was successful is because of the magnetism of his personality. And that becomes something, that becomes something in, in uh, the ecumenical world and in all interhuman relationships, is the warmth and the authenticity and the genuineness of the individual's care and concern for another. If you meet someone and you know that they don't care if they never see you again, there's not really a close bond of forms. But if, in fact, you can communicate a real desire to know something about them, to know more about them, the person is responsive to that. And so you have some kind of a bond or a relationship in which other things could be discussed. This was the power of John Paul's ecumenical spirit. He waded into Northern Europe, into the midst of the Lutheran strongholds of Northern Europe, as someone who genuinely cared and was concerned about the people that he encountered. But what were the obstacles? What are the obstacles to some kind of union between the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics? They have come to accept a joint statement on justification. What justification means is how does Christ save us? How does he justify us as sinners and save us? We believe that Jesus Christ gives his grace to us and asks us to respond in that inner kernel of human freedom and goodness and in so doing to participate with him in the process of salvation of ourselves and of others. In other words, humanity has an active role to play. The impetus, the power, the initiative, all comes from Christ, from his life, his death, and his resurrection. But we have the capacity to reject those overtures of grace, as powerful as they might be, we may reject them. If we did not reject them, we would not be free persons if we didn't have that capacity. And it is the traditional Catholic teaching that we retain, even after the fall, a certain modicum of goodness and of freedom. And that in that, this is what stirs within the depths of the human spirit where the initiative of grace is offered to us to draw us to salvation. The Lutherans do not believe that. That because of all of the reasons, I don't know, have any of you ever read much about Martin Luther? There's, a, there's an interesting book. Um, it's something you should never do in history, which is write a psychology of it. But uh, there's a psychologist that wrote a psychology of it. But actually, it's pretty good. It's called Young Man Luther, and the author is Eric Erickson. It's probably about 25, 30 years old, maybe older than that by now. But he was a psychiatrist at uh, Harvard University, and he analyzed kind of the writings of Luther. He made a lot of factual errors, but the analysis was interesting. Luther was, grew up, in a town in Germany, northern Germany at the end of the 15th, beginning of the 16th century. His mother was a townswoman and his father was a peasant, which meant there was a huge social gap between the parents. But his father rose in the urban environment and he held positions within the city government. He wanted his oldest son to go to school and be a lawyer, because then he would be successful, and he would be beyond his own heritage, beyond his own inherited status. Great ambitions the father had for the son. The son went to school and to study law. But then, in a funny medieval kind of way, he was coming back to school and um, he got into the midst of a thunderstorm. 
They were terrified of thunderstorms. And he got knocked, he was riding a donkey, he got knocked off his animal, and was terrified he was going to die. And so he made a solemn promise to St. Anne, who was a very popular saint in the Middle Ages, that if she would spare his life, he would enter the monastery. So when it was all over, he felt obliged to enter the monastery, which he did. And his father was furious, absolutely furious with him. He had a very hard time, and he was very scrupulous. And he realized that he was supposed to be humble, but he really wasn't all that humble. So he decided, and this is all in Erickson's book, but it's, it's historical fact, it's interesting. He decided that to be humble, he would clean all the latrines in the monastery. Now, I wouldn't even ask you to imagine a 16th century retreat in the monastery, but it wouldn't have been a very delightful job. But then he said, you know, the more humble I become, the prouder I am of it. <laughs> and he came to a simplistic solution. Therefore, I can't do anything good. Now this came from home, too. I can't do anything right. You ever hear kids, I can't do anything. Um, well, in his case, he truly believed that. So he went to Father Kostaupitz and he said, how can I get out of this horrible dilemma that I'm in? I'm tormented, tortured by it. It's my martyrdom, he says. And Kostaupitz says, well, read St. Paul's letter to the Romans, which he does. And he finds in there, we are justified by grace to which he adds, alone, which is not in the scriptures. And so he then pursued that, and that became the foundation of his theological position. But here's where he ended up. We are saved by grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. So in those three things, then, he has obliterated all human agency in salvation that it has nothing to do now with him because he can't do anything but be a sinner. And so if he's going to be justified, then Jesus is going to have to justify him. So what happens is this. He goes back and he reinterprets the book of Genesis, the story of the fall. In Catholic tradition, the fall is this. Obviously, humanity had great freedom and great power. And they kind of, in a sense, damaged themselves with that. But they did not destroy because they were human, because they did have an intimate relationship with God. They were made in His image and likeness. That's what made them human. Luther says, no, we were depraved. And therefore, no one can do anything but sin. No one is capable of doing anything themselves that is correct. And he describes it, and I've used this before, this is, Luther was very graphic, he said, the human society, human beings, are like a manure pile. When the grace of God falls onto them, it's like snow falling on the manure pile, a beautiful white hill. But underneath, it's still a manure pile. That's the story of the human soul. That we are saved extrinsically by grace. There is no transformation. There is no inner response. It all is worked upon us from the outside. So, immediately then, you face the question, what happens if someone's not saved? Whose fault is it? It's God. Luther never goes to predestination, and Calvin goes there only lightly. But the Calvinists, however, do not go there lightly. They take it to the extreme. But predestination is, in fact, at the root of salvation in Lutheran theology. And so what happens then, if all people are sinners and all people are depraved, Sit down and figure out how would you govern a society of depraved creatures? What kind of governments would you begin to develop? 
What kind of sense of government obligations would you have? If people cannot do anything good and take care of themselves in any way, then what you have to have is a government that emphasizes not the person, but the law and the force of the law. The law must be no respecter of persons because all persons are depraved. And they can only be made to do good externally from the outside. In this, then, one thing, just in the idea of justification by faith, the justification. What happens if we reach a theological conclusion that says, we all acknowledge that we are saved by Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ alone is our salvation. We can all say, I can say that. You can say that. Luther can say that. Do we mean existentially, socially, politically, economically the same thing? No. There is a half a millennium of history that has created institutions, ways of thinking, ways of doing, ways of being, that are radically different because of what we mean when we say the same thing. So there is a deeper level of ecumenism that is necessary. And that level is, in fact, a level that goes beneath the conceptual framework of theological agreement into the consequences of how that agreement is accepted and has been accepted historically in the lives of whole societies. There is, um, and whether this is fair or not, there was a great deal of argument for a while that Luther's understanding of law and society is what laid the groundwork in Germany for the Third Reich. That might be very unfair, or it might be kind of part of the process, it's hard to tell. But the mindset that the masses are unable to care for themselves is strictly a Protestant mindset. And it's a Protestant mindset that does not work well with us. And it's part of a conflict within North American politics as well. The Protestant ethos of the idea of the depraved leads to the government's insistence that the responsibility for every individual person lies with them and not with the individual person. It's very, very interesting that in the beginning of the 14th century, there were very strong movements within the Catholic Church that were saying somehow or other that God distributes the rights of governance to the people who then have to be responsible for their own leadership. But this was not something that the Protestants were at all comfortable with because why would you be governed by the man? And when you find the Calvinists coming over to settle this country, and this is a really interesting phenomenon, because at least when I was in grade school and high school and reading American history and the history of the Western Hemisphere, the city on the hill, the great light of New England, was the humane beginning of European colonization in the New World. The horrible Spaniards were down there doing terrible things to all the poor Indians in South America. But when you step back from that, and you find that in South America, there was an urgency to convert the natives. Because there was a very strong sense at the time that the end was near. And that it was the obligation of the missionaries to bring as many people into the church as possible through the sacrament of baptism. 
In the Northern Hemisphere, since there is no idea of conversion, really, because everyone is predestined to salvation or damnation, those who are not living righteous lives were therefore among the damned. And the damned had no civil rights. What happened in South America was the Spaniards and the Indians intermingled, created a new society, a new kind of race of people. In North America, those that weren't killed were put onto reservations to keep them away, first of all, from anything valuable, oil, agricultural lands, and so forth. The story of uh, 1912 and, uh, and the um, oil rush in Oklahoma and so forth is a, great, is a great insight into all of that. So, interesting that radically different ways of approaching the expansion of societies and cultures were based on an understanding of the nature of original sin. And the understanding of the nature of the process of justification, of redemption. There was a great battle between Luther and Erasmus over this very issue. And Luther, saying, arguing for the depravity of, of humanity, and that Erasmus had wrote brilliantly about the Catholic position of freedom of the will against Luther's idea that there is no freedom of the will. And that was when the humanists of the 16th century, Erasmus and others, moved back toward the Roman Church because they realized that what was spinning out of control was not reform, but was a revolution against the very understanding of the nature of the human person. And so, in the bottom line, the Reformation was not about God at all. It was about us. Who are we? That was the battle. And that the theological reflections that reinterpret the doctrinal statements of the 16th century are only one small baby step toward finding out the commonality that exists within various religious societies. Now, I'm talking about the Lutheran because that's something I think that has a direct impact on us. And in that direct impact on us, it also then helps us to understand in a way the depths of the issues and the depths of the, pro of the problems. Anyone says, well, you know, Protestants and Catholics, they're all the same. No, they're not. Not at all. And they're not at all because their whole understanding of themselves as human persons, theologically speaking, is radically different. They can live the ethical moral mandate, ethical moral mandate, of the uh, the ethical moral mandates of the uh, of the gospel of the life in Jesus Christ, they can do all of that, and then we can say, well, we are, as a matter of fact, then kind of on the same page because the ethical expression of our Christian faith is similar, and in that similarity. That ethical expression shows that we do similar things. True. And that's something that we should cherish and value. But in the final analysis, what we do, what it means, is not something that is easily able for the things to be reconciled to each other. But we both, in the end, understand ourselves as doing something different. And that means what we have as a residue is something different. There was a strong response on the part of the Protestants, the Lutherans, to Ut Unum Sent and Dominus Jesus. They resented very much the idea of ecclesial communities that were not full churches, which is what Dominus Jesus made clear that not being called churches 
they were called instead ecclesial communities with elements of truth and saving grace within them that makes them in some sense connected with the whole church with the Catholic church but there's another interesting piece to this as well and there's an article uh, written a long time ago, just before the Vatican Council, started by uh, theologian Romano Guardini. Guardini said that he has always struggled with what it means when a Protestant uses the word church. Because what he says is, they never used the word church in Germany to identify themselves until the rise of the Third Reich. And in the rise of the Third Reich, in the rise of the Third Reich, what happened was, in order to differentiate themselves from the, uh, from the government, they began to adapt the word church to identify their communities, these ecclesial communities. But that was not something that they did before that, Cordini said, because they did not want to be identified with the church which stood over and against the empire or the civil governments. And that only as a means of protecting themselves from absorption into the Third Reich did they resort to the use of the word church. 25 years later, there is a conflict between Catholics and Lutherans because Catholicism says they are not full churches, a claim which they never made for their own until the 1930s and the 40s. So the idea then that there is a history behind each and every one of these conflicts is something that John Paul was able to stride across on the power of his charity and his goodwill and his genuine concern for other people. While at the same time sustaining the necessity of those elements of revelation which we hold to be truths and which as such protect the human person from historical movements which would denigrate and change our understandings of ourselves and the givenness of the created order. One of the great attacks on Christianity in the modern age, a very successful attack, is to adapt a reinterpretation of the human person, to change the notion of who we are. And where this became very significant was in the 60s and 70s, in the attack on the whole sexuality, <coughs> of the human person. In order, the radical feminist deconstructionists began to say that gender is not a bio determined biologically. It is a social construct. And gender can be changed through the influence of social structures and ideologies. At first, it seemed very bizarre. They said, first of all, that we therefore must take possession of ourselves. We have the right to self-create, to be whoever we want to be. And so they also advocated plastic surgery. And this whole transgender movement is part of the fallout of that ideological revolution that began in the 1960s. One of their first poster children was Michael Jackson. And that's why they all loved him. He was a very talented person, there's no question about it. But he became kind of an island, an icon for the deconstructionist movement that was so powerful. This is what lies underneath the whole, which is the whole idea of gay marriage. Your sexuality is not determined biologically. It's a social construct. And you are free to do with yourself whatever you wish because you are not bound by the patriarchal 
determinism of biology. That's their argument. And it filters down into the social media and into the culture. And what happens when it does that is that, I just read a statistic today, 85% of Catholic youths see nothing wrong with homosexuality. It's not attacking the homosexuals at all. But it is saying this new reformation, this new revolution of reinterpreting the truth of the human person was let loose centuries ago. And it has political, economic, and now sexual implications in modern society. John Paul was very aware of this, as was Benedict XVI. And it's why they tried to use, John Paul used his personality to dull the edge of the new revolution. World Youth Day, all of those things. He knew he had the capacity to do that God had given him that. Without yielding and saying, Gee, everybody's just so great. Why doesn't everybody just do whatever they want? And who are we to say they can't? And so when we get reinterpreted by culture, the Catholic Church says, this is not who you are, and this will not end well. Pursue it to its limits, and you will regret it. And I think that in this whole ecumenical venture, there is more at stake than theological agreement there is the destiny of the human person, and there is the reality of the created order as it came forth from the hand of God. When I see in all these major developments a singularity of focus on the very significant issues of doctrine, perhaps the ancillary studies have to wait their turn, but they're becoming urgent, and it seems to me that these doctrines have embedded themselves in political, social, economic structures of global societies and the lived experiences of communities for centuries and they are not an indifferent pursuit. We can trace with great, um, in some simple ways, we can trace the revolution in Western civilization about the identity of the human person to the Reformation of the 16th century which is why John Paul found it so urgent to draw these elements of human society back into a conversation with the Church of Christ. And that he found this an urgent reality. He was roundly condemned for some of his ecumenical adventures, if you remember that. But as long as we understand the force with which he retained the fundamental basic truths of Revelation, those five realities that he outlined in the Lutheran dialogue, as long as we are willing to focus and understand that these are immutable and that they have within themselves the capacity to liberate human persons from the revolutions, the cultural revolutions of every age, that we too should be grateful to St. John Paul for having made the connections that make it possible for Catholicism to dialogue in some sense with the root causes of the disintegration of the understanding of the human it is not the case that the task of the church is to assume leadership on the basis of the doctrine of faith. But it also poses an enormous task for the church that moves beyond the zeitgeist of the modern era, the spiritus mundi, the spirit of the age. It cannot be our spirit. And John Paul taught us that in his whole ecumenical endeavor. And so, a long time. All right. I'll be quiet. And, and any questions or anything that any of you would, would like to ask? Any challenges? Or good? Mm -hmm.
Um, I remember reading a, a news story a little while, maybe it was last year, that uh, Lutheran leaders had invited Catholic leaders to celebrate the 500th, 500th anniversary of the Reformation with the, the posting of the 95 Theses. And I was wondering, because when I read it, I was really kind of annoyed. Like, why would we celebrate our disunity? But I was wondering if you could just speak to that, what your thoughts are. I don't know if the Catholics agreed to go, but um, well, I know, know the invitation. the interesting thing there. on that is, is that it was the German bishops, of all people, who had kind of put this thing together. And when the statements came out on it, not so long ago, um, Cardinal Kassler um, had, uh, was one of the main movers in the whole thing. He was, he was very upset because they had rejected all of the Catholic interventions in the understanding of the celebration of the, of the centenary of, of Luther. And that there was a question as to whether the German bishops would even go to the, uh, to the celebration or not. You see, this is the fine line. Always when you ask these questions, always put it back in terms of familial relationships. What celebrations can you go to or should you go to? And which ones shouldn't you? If your niece or nephew is having a gay marriage, can you go to the wedding? If your baptized niece or nephew is getting married outside the church, can you go to the wedding? These are very, these are very real family situations. What do you do about stuff like this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you do, if you, if you are married without dispensation, all that kind of stuff. If uh, you know, if. If you have some member of your family or some close friend and they're heavy drug users, um, you know, would you let your kids go to their house and stay overnight? I mean, we, we make these kinds of decisions all the time, and they're called judgments, and they're legitimate, and they are authentic. What judgments we can't make is on the inner disposition of the other person's soul, but their behavior we can judge against the criteria of revelation, which is what John Paul did in the, in the dialogue. He, he, he presided in Lutheran churches, he preached in Lutheran churches, he had vespers with Lutheran archbishops, <coughs> all of that. But he never yielded on the primacy of the face to see, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, any of those things. So should we have a celebration of Martin Luther? I don't know what that means. I think that Many people might do it in goodwill without understanding at all what the whole thing was all about. Um, but I think that there would have to be real parameters established as to how that celebration would proceed if we were to be present. And, I, and those are the things that the Lutherans in Germany at least rejected. Well, um, a lot of them wondered, and, I, and, and you have probably wondered a lot more than I have, that at the time of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, the Catholic Church was the dominant religion, and all of a sudden, somebody comes up and says, we want to do this differently. And he started gaining traction. Mm -hmm. Could the, if you were to rewrite history or, you know, look at it again, what could the Catholic Church have done to avoid the split? We, we certainly weren't well equipped to deal with it at the time. And actually, there were a lot of overtures toward Luther, but they were overtures that came too late. And it got connected to political movements. And it got connected to the very complex nature of the empire and the role of the territorial princes within the empire. And what happened was very pious Catholics, like Frederick the Wise of Saxony, who had the largest collection of relics in all of Europe, and who was a devout Catholic, was the one who protected Luther, because it gave him leverage 
against the emperor. So this kind of thing, it happened very quickly. There wasn't a lot of time left. There was another factor. There were the facts of the taxes to Rome, which were deeply resented. And uh, there was something called the annates, which meant that in the diocese, the income of the first year of a new bishop in a diocese went to Rome. And so the Pope, one of the things that started all this was Albert, um, who was already Bishop of Magdeburg, Archbishop of Magdeburg, and uh, wanted to be the Archbishop of Mainz also. He wanted two seats, but he had to get a dispensation to do that. To do that would cost him a lot of money because the dispensation was expensive. And in Mainz, they had had three bishops die in 10 years, which means three out of 10 years, all of their income went to Rome. So he had to borrow in order to pay for the dispensation. He borrowed from a bank run by the Hoogers out of, out of uh, Augsburg. In borrowing then, he had to recoup his losses so that he had enough money. So they negotiated to have the plenary indulgence for the building of St. Peter's, which was not allowed in the German archdiocese, the diocese of the north. Albert gave permission for it on the, on, the, on the condition that he got half the revenues. So that when he hired someone to preach the indulgence, he hired the best salesman he could find, which was the Dominican fire John Tetzel. The whole idea of indulgences, which is a legitimate idea, the idea of the sharing within the community of the holiness of the saints, was cheapened into a financial transaction and triggered the, uh, and, and, and triggered the revolution. Um, they had a they had a little ditty they sang when John Tetzel came to town into the into the purse the coin doth ring out of purgatory the soul doth spring. So they had reduced all of that to a financial transaction. So there was a spark that set off the revolution. Now Luther knew what an indulgence really was, but this was an occasion to vent his anger. By the time it was vented, within a year or two, it had become so entangled in imperial politics, there was no coming back. Rome sent delegate after delegate to Wittenberg to discuss the possibilities of some kind of reconciliation and so forth. And, in, and, and they, did so, they did so in good faith. But by then, the rage was on, and there was no way, shape, or form and they were aggressively dismantling the structures of the church and taking them over, which was no small incentive to keep going. And they got all the lands and all the buildings and all of that kind of stuff as well. So it's very complicated. But in order to do that, if you believed in the sacramental system, and if you believed in saving grace that transforms from within, you would not have been able to pursue the revolution. So you had to get rid of that. And that way you, would, you had no responsibilities or obligations. Because your salvation was taken care of by Jesus Christ alone. That helped you. And anything else? Any other questions? Monsignor, just, just a clarification about that. So, so Luther, Luther's uh, development, that was his objective? He, he, this change in the view of the hu human person, that really was? That was, that, I, I'm trying to figure out, is that, was that? Did he set out that? to change our understanding of the human person? No. Did he de facto do so? Yes. Yes, right. So it was accidental almost. It was it was a consequence of his theology. Yeah. Yeah. But a profound impact. That's why and you know, people say, Oh well that's just prejudice to say that, but it wasn't a Catholic historian that said 
when you follow this line of thought of law and all of this kind of stuff, there is a connectivity between the revolution of the 16th century and the revolution of the middle of the 20th century in Germany. Um, so, yeah. So it has consequences far, far removed from the source. And just like our cultural revolution today, where we are really in the mode of denying any kind of biological determinism in the human person as a means of liberation of that human person. We're changing things that are going to have consequences for a very, very, very long time. What we're going to find, really, is the death of civilizations and the rise of new ones, because it is, in fact, a nihilistic and self-destructive Program. And this is what John Paul understood. He un and why he. Uh, That's why he called about the culture of death. It is the culture of death. It's nihilistic. And it isn't being mean to people. It's being nice to people 200 years from now so that they're still around. You know? But, but if, if the culture, the, 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 uh, the secular culture is dominating us now, right. and we're split. Right. How are we going to handle it singly? I mean, if it's, if, isn't there some point that we ought to get together and face the real enemy? Well, there is some point where that should happen, but it doesn't look like it's going to anytime <laughs> soon. Um, I, mean, but, I mean, there's an urgency now. I well, mean, there is an urgency, but there was an urgency here as well. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, you know, is that um, what, what, and if you read Calvin's Institutes, it's very clear in Calvin's Institutes, that what they were, in, in, the, in the 11th century, Gregory VII launched a revolution, Pope Gregory VII, to wrest the church free from civil control, okay? It was a long, long battle. What the Reformation wanted to do, and Calvin says this, is the Reformation wanted to give authority back to the civil government, which in the 16th century wasn't quite so bizarre because the civil government, it was a Christian community. The civil government was Christian. It wasn't 100 years later that that started to change. And then what happened was they were then tied forever to secular governments who secularized the ideology of the society, the ideas of the society. It's exactly what's happening here in this country. The civil government has assumed the mantle of a religion and is demanding conformity. And saying, if you say, well, it's not religious freedom, they say, oh, we're not interfering with your religion. You can go to church if you want to. It's purely an individual thing. But the idea of Christianity as a corporate entity, they deny. So the state of California now says basic health care is every religious institution has to fund abortions. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, some will capitulate. Some will not. Um, but, and it was the same way in the Reformation. Some capitulated and some did not. And so what happens then is you ended up with a very fractured society and one which traveled very different routes, you know, into the construction of new societies. And that's the thing I think that Max Weber is so interested, interesting about, is because he certainly sees that and explains it very, very clearly. And so, so even now then, in the split within the church, it's, it's all of these, these behavioral issues that are getting all of the attention and, but it's the, it is the same issue of the, of the understanding of the human person that's behind right. it. And even that split, the one side... And within, and, and within the church, exactly like in the 16th century, there is a segment of the church moving into government religion and abandoning Christianity in, in, in the depths of, of the Christian ethos. Yeah, but that happened before. Right. I mean, that's a lot of them, a lot of them said, all right, let's go, and they went. <laughs> Any other questions?
All right, thank you, Monsignor. Okay.